good afternoon good evening or good morning if you are in another part of this planet welcome to this very interesting webinar today uh, we have today uh, a topic that uh, i was talking about this a little while ago with my fellow panelists uh, a topic that actually has uh, an universal appeal uh, something that every banker around this planet is keen to know about uh, and is actually looking to practice and embrace it. So we are going to talk today about adopting and implementing Basel IV. What is Basel IV? Why should we actually be going about adopting and implementing it? And more importantly, how are we going to go about it? So the what's, the why's, and the how's. Uh, this webinar is be being hosted by IBS Intelligence, and this is actually being hosted in partnership with Walters Kluwer. Today, I have great pride in introducing my fellow panelists here. Uh, with us today is Mr. Farhan Memu. Uh, Farhan is the Chief Risk Officer uh, of Gulf Bank in Kuwait, a leading bank in Kuwait. Uh, Farhan comes with an illustrious career of 30 plus years including some very in, in interesting roles that he had at Deutsche and, and City in his, in his last role. And he's been with the bank, uh, Gulf Bank, for more than seven years, Farhan? Yes, exactly. Correct. Thank you, Farhan. Thank you for being with us today. Pleasure to be here. Uh, we also have with us uh, Xavier Duba. Uh, Xavier is uh, the Director for Product Management, Finance, Risk, and Regulatory Reporting at Walters Kluwer FRR. Uh, Xavier is no uh, novice to the space we are speaking about today. He is a guru in the area of adopting and implementing Basel IV. You know, and you can talk to Xavier for hours and he would actually be, you, know, you, could, you could learn so much from him you know, through this topic. And I'm sure the audience today are going to lap at every word you're going to say, Xavier. Welcome. Thank you. Very happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Xavier. So uh, once again, this webinar uh, you know, is something that we're going to have. It's hosted by IBS Intelligence, which is the Financial Technology Research and Advisory and Publications Unit of CEDA. Uh, your moderator, myself, my name is Ram. I'm a senior partner with CEDA. Uh, the way we're structuring this session today is we would have a, uh, an introductory presentation from Xavier. He'll, he'll share with us some insights and experiences uh, that I think all of us are looking forward to hear from you. Following which we're going to have a, a session where there would be an interactive expert panel discussion session where we'll actually have a few questions uh, with both our panelists here today. Of course, at the end of the session, uh, the last 10 minutes would be reserved for questions from the audience. And we would obviously be encouraging uh, questions from you and we would be uh, happy to answer them to the extent we can. But, the audience cannot get away by just waiting for asking questions towards the end of it. You would be asked a few questions. We do have some polls that we would be asking you to, to vote periodically. Uh, a, to make sure we get some feedback from you and B, to also ensure that you are finding it interesting. So before I hand over the floor to Xavier, if I may start with the first poll. Uh, mind you, the panelists have also see, not seen these poll questions, so they would be, they would be voting along with the audience here. So I'm going to go with the uh, first question. And the question is this. The greatest challenge in driving Basel and related compliance from your standpoint is A, access to access and collation of relevant data from across systems. B, creating awareness and training of relevant skills within the organization. C, building an institutionalized process of adoption, and D, availability of relevant technology systems and tools. Unfortunately, all of the above is not an option. So you have to choose one of these four. So you've got to choose what is the greatest of these four. Uh, let's see how many people have, I, I, we still have another 10 seconds. 
And maybe Xavier, that sets the tone for maybe what we're going to hear from you uh, at the next session. So I'm going to end the poll here. Uh, we are a minute into the poll and I'm ending the poll. And let's see what the answers are. Ah, 47%, almost half the population believe that access to relevant data and collating it is the greatest challenge. Farhan, I could see you nodding there. Absolutely, yes, yeah. That's, yes. Uh, <laughs> Xavier, so that's some fodder for your presentation. So without much ado, let me hand over the floor to you. Uh, take us through what you have to say. Thank you, Ram. Let me share my screen and let me do that properly. So <clears throat> I think I am now sharing my screen and you are seeing my presentation, right? Oh, yes. Thank you, Ram. Uh, so thank you for, for uh, listening to, to this introduction. So the purpose is really to give you uh, some insight about Basel IV and as well as some lessons learned, I would say. And we have already uh, the first lesson uh, that, that you all, that I don't have to tell you because 47% uh, of you already know that the the biggest challenge is the data collection. But I would say that this is not, unfortunately, typical to Basel. This is really uh, across all the regulatory reporting and the new regulation requirements. Um, so le let me start. So as you know, uh, Basel III comes from the 2008-2009 crisis. And Basel Committee first issued some so short-term actions, what we call two, Basel 2.5 then some longer term action. And then finally, they came up with the finalization of Basel III. What all this, which is um, called Basel IV, um, and let me close my, yes, that will be better. Um, so this Basel III finalization is so big in terms of impact, concrete impact, that many in the industry have called it Basel IV, because the impact on system, on processes, is so huge that it deserves a new number. But officially, it is a Basel III finalization. So, and this Basel III finalization still evolves. Uh, we had a new minimum capital requirement on market risk. There has been a CVA standard update. But this was all done at Basel committee level for internationally active banks. And as you know, it has to, um, it has to be translated into the local uh, regulations. And in that process that you will probably all face, there are possible changes, additions. There are also the rules for non-internationally um, active banks. There are different deadlines, and this is a, it can become a nightmare. And there is as well the local regulatory reporting. And this local regulatory reporting is probably what most banks see as the first and immediate requirement. So this local legislation uh, translation is, is a process that will be different for all of us um, in, in all the countries. And I said I would uh, uh, talk about some European experience. Why? Because uh, in Europe, uh, it has been called CRD5. And the first set of Basel reforms, a part of the Basel reform, has come into in, in what has been called the CRR2. And this CRR2 has been in place mainly um, uh, applicable as of June this year. So, we have the implementation of Basel of CRR2 uh, in, in our back. And this timing issue, just the timing is an issue because it, this CRR2 is expected to be followed by a CRR3 that should be, that is expected to be officially on the 1st of January 2023. But today, we don't have yet in Europe any draft text of CRR3. So, which is raising a lot of question, uncertainty, and it's, it's not easy for bank nor for um, 
uh, software providers like Walter Sluer to, to deal with. <clears throat> so let's look at, at Basel for what it is about. So, and here I will only show the changes, the changes that uh, Basel for impacts. If you look at the capital charges, so the risk weighted assets, the credit risk is changed with a new standardized approach, with new credit risk mitigation, with a lot of things, including counterparty credit risk with the well-known SACCR method. The market risk has changed with the FRTB. The CVA risk gets two new methods. The operational risk is totally changed. On the minimum requirements side, there is on the on funds, there is the output floor. The output floor is the minimum based on the standardized approach for banks that are using internal models. Next to that, you have also the total loss absorbing capacity that is not directly, um, uh, strictly speaking, Basel IV, but um, it is about the, um, the recovery, resolution and recovery. And this uh, comes very, uh, is tightly integrated in Basel IV uh, with this regulation, especially in Europe. You have liquidity with the new NSFR that gets now binding. You have the interest rate risk in the banking book with the six shocks. And then you have two aspects that have both a minimum requirement and a capital charge potentially. It's the large exposures and the leverage ratio. So all of that is changed by Basel IV. Now, there are some dependencies and this is the first time it is so important in Basel IV is that between all these calculations, there are links. And for example, if I take the counterparty credit risk, CCR, the results, the exposure value for derivative, because that's what it computes, should be used by not only credit risk, but also CVA risk, but also large exposure and leverage ratio. So you see one component has to be used four times. So this is really a dependency. And there are other dependencies, as you can see in, in the picture. There is also a dependency towards the output floor for bank using standardized and internal models. And then last but not least, and you all know that, there is the, finally the regulatory reporting. The regulatory reporting and the pillar three disclosures. And all these are related. So if you look at it, there is no real big block of the Basel framework, of the Basel chain, of the Basel production chain that is not changed. And that is really important to realize. So if we come to some takeaways from, from the European uh, perspective, uh, the first one is you will probably face different timelines, probably slipping timelines, and you will have it to implement a number of phases. But what is critical is that you take a global approach. You don't take the slight uh, bo box that is changed or the slight piece of regulation that is changed just now and then the next one and then the next one. No, you know upfront that Basel IV will change your full chain. So therefore you need a global approach. And even if you have faced in there, that's uh, have a global project or most successful client have a plan for the full, they have uh, engaged, they have a strategy for CR2 and CRR3 and it's a global project for them. A second lessons learned is there is, everything will be changed more or less likely depending on the size of banks you are. But so it's the right time to reconsider what you keep, what you improve, what you upgrade, and what you don't keep. So it's very important that you re really reassess the full picture. And the third uh, lesson is consistency is key. Uh, it's true for uh, across risk types and reporting, for example, if you compute counterparty credit risk exposure, you have to provide it to, to CVA risk, large exposure leverage ratio. 
So make sure you have one calculator because otherwise you might have differences in this total calculation. But it is also important, and this is a trend that is very effective in Europe, is beyond Basel, uh, there are cross consistency check between all types of reporting. The financial reporting, what is called FinRap in Europe, the, the prudential reporting, the Basel reporting, what is called CoREP, and they do cross changes. And they, they also have an accredits, granular data for the credits. And the regulator is asking more and more cross changes, uh, cross validation across these different uh, reports. So consistency is key because otherwise you end up with issue in your re regulatory reporting. And that's what you want to prevent. Let's move to another topic that is that has had a very important impact. It's called proportionality. What is proportionality? It's the idea that there should be a balance between the size, the complexity, the level of activity risk that you have, and the methods to compute this risk, the reporting, the quantity, the frequency. If you're a big bank, it's normal that you get complex method. If you're a very small bank, it's normal that you have sim simpler methods. That's the idea and it makes a lot of sense. It is, different, it is implemented in different ways across the, the globe. So some countries implement proportionality by defining some categories of banks and uh, this way. Some other countries, and it's the case of Europe, they classify it, they do it per domain. You may be a very small bank, but with a very high market risk. Or you, you may be a very large bank that, is, that has nearly no trading book because it's not in your strategy. So they don't do it per size of bank, they do it per size of the individual domains like market risk, counterparty, and so on. It, it makes it more complex. But whatever your country will apply, this bank category or domain will define some specific measures. And these measures will lead you to different methods. This is very important to understand. It is very important that you realize that. An example, for market risk, in Europe, you have, so to speak, three categories, the small, medium, and large. These are not regulatory terms. They have a trading book size, and they define how to compute this size. And depending on the size of your trading book, you will have different methods, what you see in the right column. You have different methods to apply. Either if you're very small, in terms of trading book size, you have exemptions or derogations, and it's pretty easy. Or you have the standardized approach for what is called a medium bank, or what the Basel Committee calls the Basel Simplified Standardized Approach. Or if you're a large bank or with a large trading book, you need to do the FRTB. So this is an example. What can you take away from that? Is it is very important to understand the proportionality in your jurisdiction. I am meeting banks that do not know first that there is proportionality and that they have to decide what they want to do. So for example, if you can do a, a, a simple method, uh, you don't want to implement a project FRTB, which is a huge project. So it is, imp it is important because it defines your business impact, and that is key. And it also uh, determines what you need to implement. So the second is that proportionality def defines your requirement. You need to know where you are and where you want to be. For example, if you are at the limit between two categories, you need to know whether you want to grow and, and make 
the, the methods of the higher category, or if you say, no, I keep small uh, and I implement the, the simpler method of the ca category lower. This is important because the impact, not only business, but in terms of project is very important. And because proportionality will define your project, it will make it more or less complex, more or less costly, more or less long. This is really important. So a lot of banks have had issues with proportionality in understanding proportionality and positioning themselves in this proportionality uh, in Europe. So this is a lesson learned, Take, pay attention to that. A third aspect is, is this. Um, if you look at regulatory reporting, actually you have three point in times. You are doing the, the regulatory reporting for your month of September, and you get three values for my example, the liquidity coverage ratio, the leverage ratio, and the tier one capital ratio. These are three points in time. But actually when you are doing ALM, for example, you are forecasting things and you are forecasting to the future. And actually this is what banks would like to do is to be able to forecast or to, to, to extrapolate, to project. But of course you don't know the future. So the, te the technique to you to do that is to use scenarios. And so you want to project using different scenarios. And this is what banks want to do is to have the integration of four dimensions, the regulatory metrics, the LCR, the capital ratio, the, the capital requirements, together with their business metrics, internal metrics, together with the time dimension and the scenarios. So what can you learn from that in Europe, from Europe? Why do they ask for that? There is a mandatory aspect. It is the ILAP and the ICAP. Within the ICAP and ILAP, which are pillar two, there is a requirement to do planning, capital planning, this is a requirement, and stress testing. It is part of pillar two. So it is really part of the, your duty in terms of regulation to do this planning and stress testing. What some banks do include that upfront in their requirements, and they come to us and they ask, yes, we want to do that. Some banks do just focus on the regulatory report. What the experience shows is then they come back, for example, when they ask for, uh, we'd like to do the EBA stress testing exercise, can you help us? So they ask to move from a regulatory reporting solution to a projection to do capital planning and stress testing, which are also mandatory. It's also useful for business decision impacts. When you want to take a business decision, you want to see the impact and to see whether you are still within the regulatory boundaries or your internal boundaries. And that is probably the most important thing. And probably a lot of you already do that or some of you already do that, it's today. With the Basel IV, I would say sensitivity, the sensitivity of the newly regulatory metrics. In Basel I, it was kind of totally uh, away from the really internal measures and so on. It was not really fine enough. But today, the Basel IV metrics, those regulatory metrics are uh, useful to uh, steer the business. And so today we have banks that integrate these regulatory metrics into their daily management. The typical example is the liquidity coverage ratio and the net stable funding ratio. We have banks that want to compute and project on a daily basis their LCR for the 30 coming days. And they do that, they actually do that. And these, they want to have exactly the regulatory metrics as it is defined by the regulator. They don't want a proxy. They want exactly the, 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 the LCR and they project it. 
So this is a trend. They do, banks, advanced banks, use the regulatory metrics in the daily management of the bank. The key points for a Basel program, and I will terminate with that. First is establish a governance. And this governance should include the CFO and CRO. Sometimes we, we meet bank and, and depending on whether it's the CFO or the CRO, we have different concerns. But the most successful banks and many banks as well are have a Basel IV program that is led by both the CRO and CR, uh, CFO and CRO at the right level in the group. So not only at the lowest level entity, but at the top of the group, you need that. It's very important to, to, to have that. Second is assess properly the current situation. Across entities, if you have a group, and across risk type, market risk, credit risk, and so on. What we often see is banks saying, yes, yes, we are, uh, we are well integrated. And it's true, they, they are well integrated. But when we ask about all details, they say, oh, yes, for example, market risk is handled by the treasury department. And it's not within the, 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 this Basel project. So this is a typical example, the, the market risk being a site, being uh, out of, not out of control, but of, out of sight. A second uh, typical example is uh, we have a few entities that are special purpose vehicle, but these refer to securitization. They need to be consolidated. Ah, we don't know what they do. So it's important that you have a global view and take really the time to do that properly. The third item is to set properly your objectives, your scope and targets. Uh, we, I just talked about the entities. I just, I talked about the proportionality and what are the different methodologies you want to use. What is very important is the service level. Do you want to compute that on a monthly basis for your reporting, or do you want to be able to run that, so to speak, at any point in time in order to, um, meet the, the, the regulatory requirements, but also uh, be able to respond uh, to, to the um, uh, executive questions, or in case of stress, be able uh, to uh, really follow up your situation on, on a really detailed basis. If you determine what you want, what is the service level, then it, it really means that it defines the level of automation that you need. It, it uh, defines the need for the data, the update frequency to receive the data. That's very important. And you want to, to define what are your target risk services. Is it pure regulatory reporting? Do you want to do planning and scenarios? Do you want to be able to do to assess the business impacts on your decisions, this might uh, determine the solution you will select for. There are reporting solutions that do reporting only, and they will not fit if you want to do stress testing as well. So remember what you want to do. And for fourth uh, is planning phases, and I guess that's obvious, and you should align that with your regulatory uh, deadlines uh, that are specific to your country. So what are the takeaways uh, from, from, from that section, from the, those key points? The first is make sure you gather all business requirements, both the regulatory one that you want to meet, and don't forget about the pillar two, uh, the stress testing, and second, have your requirement across the group. Know what you want to do for each entity. This is a, a typical issue that uh, some banks do say, uh, we manage that 
at the group level for all entities and we say we have a solution we use it at the group level and we so to speak impose this same solution at all the entities and usually that that works smoothly because they impose the same solution there are other banks that say uh, at the head office i impose to my entities to provide me with this data and it's up to my entities to determine how they want to work they have the liberty all what they need to do is to provide me with this data and and it's for them to search for the best solution and what we often see with that is that it's a bit uh, not, not chaotic but some entities do it very well and some entities do it poorly and when we are at the head office level we see that we the data quality for from some entity is good but from some other entity is poor and there is delay and, and all that so you better have a group approach simplify your architecture that's very important for example, we have a bank, a, a tier one bank that is projecting LCR on the, for the next 30 days. They do that and it's the exact regulatory LCR. And this is in the treasury department. And on the regulatory reporting, they have another solution that has, uh, that cal computes the LCR but that only on a monthly basis for the regulatory report. And so they have two applications that are computing the exact LCR. One is able to project and it sits with the treasury department. One is not able to project and sits with the reporting department. So there, it is obvious their next step is to expand the solution that, it, that can do the, the, the most meaning the one in treasury that can do projection they want to use this solution also for regulatory reporting because it can it, it really produces lcr at uh, uh, regulatory reporting uh, detail and correction level so this is a way to simplify but also to reduce cost and increase consistency another way to, to improve costs is to reuse the same solution across the different entities, because then you, you have really a project that you can roll out and, and you have this, you can anticipate the same data quality. And the conclusion that I would bring here is um, we have seen Basel 1, we have seen Basel 2, we have seen Basel 3 and the Basel 3 finalization. Between uh, Basel II and Basel III, there were approximately 10 years. Between the crisis that led to the first Basel III changes, 2008, 2009, and now Basel IV, there is also a big 10 years. So, and it's, it's really now even quite more mature. So the Basel solution that you will put in place should stay for probably the next 15 years. So make sure that it will satisfy your regulators, your auditors, and that it will also satisfy your management because they have also uh, some expectation, for example, about planning, about seeing the impact of business decisions on their capital ratio and all that. So because this solution that you put in place for the next 15 years uh, will stay, you should really take um, that upfront. So in summary, take a global approach that you will implement with in phases, take all the requirements and make sure that what you are putting in place now will be stable and sufficient, good for the 15 coming years. And with that, I finish my introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Xavier plan in phases but plan for 15 years that's the that's a very interesting takeaway i should say i mean these are days when people actually are looking to actually make those short term decisions and and here you are actually encouraging us to make sure we look for 
the long term. I could see a lot of questions are coming up on the Q&A and we will actually reserve them for the audience Q&A section. Uh, the next session is for us to actually jump into an expert view panel uh, where we'll actually have some thoughts from Farhan and from Xavier. But before we actually jump into that, time for a quick poll uh, where I would actually have our audience to give us a perspective on what stage of the journey that Zevi just explained, uh, would you rate yourself to be at? Would you think you are yet to commence any activity? Uh, are you at an ideation stage or a gap analysis as, you know, uh, setting the objectives and scope as Zevi explained, uh, where you're assessing the situation, setting the objectives, or you, you think you have a detailed plan, uh, detailed plan and have commenced the activities, or you know, or if you are in a part of the world that has already started the implementation, right? Okay, uh, we have another 20 seconds. Uh, and I guess the, the interesting piece, Xavier, while we are waiting for, uh, for the poll to complete is, uh, you talked about those four key takeaways, right? Building a governance framework that has the CFO and the CRO and making sure that you make an assessment of the situation across the entity and across risk types, uh, making sure we set the objectives and the scope and the target and, and making sure you're having a planning and the planning is in phases. To me, and I'm sure Farhan would agree with me, this sounds like a plan that would be applicable for any, any implementation or any transformation, leave alone possible. Yes. So, uh, uh, but I think that was, that was, that was sound advice area. Thanks for that. Well, our poll time is over, so I'm concluding the poll and let's see what the results are. Well, more than half of our audience are at a stage where they are ideating or planning, right? Which very much sets the tone, uh, should I say, for the next session that we're having. Uh, and I will probably, you know, go to you, Farhan, and actually maybe, you know, based on what you know, we've heard from Xavier and from your own experience, right? I mean, if you had to tell us, you know, how would Basel IV be different from our earlier regulations and, you know, the key tenets of Basel IV from your perspective as a practitioner, uh, what would the key tenets be? I mean, how would you like to summarize it? Well, first of all, uh, thank you, Ram, for having me and thanks for your, you know, very kind uh, opening uh, comments and hello, everyone. Um, look, Basel III final reforms is what Basel Committee calls these rules. And as the name implies, I think at least in thinking, uh, it is an extension of your uh, evolution of your Basel III. Um, uh, so, so, but that's not necessarily true in its, in, in, in its implementation, as uh, we have pointed out. I think the implementation uh, will be much more revolutionary because of uh, the way uh, it has been laid out. Uh, but I think a couple of points I should uh, point out, you know, in terms of the key uh, direction or key uh, thought process, which I think uh, is, uh, is, is driving uh, these new uh, reforms. And I think, so if you look at uh, the, the Basel III, I think the focus was all on capital, on, on enhancing the capital, whereas here now, uh, we are really looking at the determinants of that capital. And we are trying to specifically RWA, for example, you know, and, and fine tuning uh, uh, the determinants rather than the capital itself. That's not to say that there's no not going to be any capital impact. They may very well be, but that's certainly not the uh, the, the intent or the thrust of the new regulations. Um, the other point I think uh, importantly in these regulations is that it's taking us back to a more prescriptive nature. And so there's more prescription here rather than discretion. So in fact, if you look at the rules, a lot of the discretion is being taken away. And, and so there is a tilt towards standardized uh, approaches, right? Um, and that basically, why that is being done ties in with the two basic objectives of, of the new rules. So if I were to just sum up two things, uh, which, which are the primary motivators of this is I think the committee, Basel committee wanted to increase the comparability of ratios and, uh, and, and reduce the excessive variability that exists at this point in time 
when you compare, you know, re different regions to each other or different institutions within a, a region even. Um, and also, I think, uh, I think as I, as Xavier mentioned that in enhance the sensitivity and granularity, um, uh, you know, of the standardized approaches. Right, and there are a few things that that it does uh, to to achieve those objectives, and I suppose we can get into that uh, later. Uh, but I think I'll stop here. You know, so that's kind of the thirty thousand uh, feet view of uh, of the new rules. The, call it Basel IV uh, uh, or call it Basel III. You know, final reforms, as the committee likes to call it. Very useful. Very interesting, uh, Farhan. Um, prescriptive, not. Uh, descriptive, improve comparability, enhance sensitivity. Uh, I think very, should I say, uh, uh, important takeaways, right? But I'll, I'll now go back to Xavier, and I think the question I want to actually go back to you is you've spoken so much about, uh, you know, how one goes about doing this and, and what it is all about. But I think there is a very pertinent question, Xavier, and this is about why should someone do this, right? And I... I guess it may be, and, and considering that a majority of our audience here are in the stage of planning for one and looking to actually go through this journey. You know, if you were to actually, and, and you've seen this from various parts of the world across continents, uh, and, you know, and, and I think the US, you have a perspective that could actually be more, should I say, uh, um, across places and across different kinds of organizations. What is the benefit? Why is Basel IV beneficial to a bank? And if and if you were to say this for a large bank or a small bank, you want to make a difference, or is it the same for everybody? I think that you can make it, uh, or, or the banks can make it beneficial to to her. Uh, the the and this is what we see is that usually. Um, when you are a small bank, you think you have less resource, you think more in terms of uh, the next step, the next deadline, fulfilling the next requirement and so on. But this is really the time to, 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 take, uh, to take a step back and, and think about your strategy. What we see globally, um, and the trend is very far in, in Europe, is the integration of finance and risk. That's one aspect. For example, you see um, in IFRS 9, for example, the PD, LGD, the PD, LGD that are on the credit risk, uh, they are used in finance and risk and the regulatory reporting. So this is a one generic trend. Another trend is that with the improved granularity, uh, sorry, the improved sensitivity of the, the metrics, the regulatory metrics, the Basel IV, it is now really used, uh, can be used and is used in the daily management. So we see there an integration. So the benefit that you can have, that you can take as a bank, if you leave it as a separate uh, Basel for application and effort and cost, you will, it, it will stay a cost for you. It will st stay something mandatory that is just to check the marks. If you integrate that into your daily operation and in actually into the business, into the management of the bank, and actually this is not something else than what the Basel committee asked, they want you to use the same techniques as what you are really doing in the business. So if you can um, integrate those Basel metrics in your daily management of the bank, then you, it's not anymore a separate aspect, a separate silo, but it's really integrated. And this is where you can get benefits. You can get benefits in planning, stress testing, evaluating your business decision relative to those, to those uh, regulatory constraints. This is really where it gets real value. And the, the good thing about this is in the past, it was not possible to be done. But today, the technology allows to do that. There are solutions that project 
exact regulatory metrics and that are also doing the internal metrics so that help doing in the same tool, uh, managing the bank and providing the, the, the value for the regulatory report. So the granularity is not just for regulatory compliance and checking the box, but for day-to-day -day management. Quite interesting. And, and maybe Farhan, I would actually take that question to you. So why is it important to integrate, you know, this whole regulatory compliance in the risk management ethos, if you may, right? Uh, it's one thing to say I can use it and there is technology that's available today, but why should I do it? Yeah, so in addition to the points Xavier made, I think there is this goes beyond risk management and regulatory uh, realm. I think if I were to sum it up in one word, I, I, I would say discipline. So why discipline? I'm talking about uh, discipline in your business strategy. I'm talking about discipline in your risk appetite. So some of these regulations will force you to think, especially if you are a bank which is sensitive about capital and capital deployment, right? So because it goes down to the level of detail uh, that it does. Uh, so if you take, uh, you know, your real estate portfolio, it cuts it in so many ways, not just by LTV, but also whether it's, it's land uh, uh, finance or if it's uh, revenue generating real estate, etc. cetera. Um, you know, it will force you to, to, to redefine or at least at minimum think about your strategy. How do you position your portfolio to maximize your capital uh, deployment versus your returns? Right, so the, there are elements built into it, which at the moment, uh, you know, banks, maybe some banks do, some banks don't uh, to varying degrees, but certainly not with the kind of discipline that this will impose. So you will have, you will have it laid out in front of you. These are your options. If you go this route, if you skew your portfolio towards a certain type of uh, uh, lending, uh, be it within the real estate space or general corporates or in retail, where again, it's by product, you know, they specify uh, your, uh, your charges, um, you know, so, so that will help you define your strategy in a more disciplined manner. So yeah, that's so if I were to make one point. Of this I was, I'll see if I can use the same content. Sorry. I'll... There is a uh, observation I had uh, for our and, and discipline, I guess, extends to actually becoming more self-aware as a bank, you know, in terms of yes. what my own strategy is, what's my capital, you know, uh, and how do I deploy it? Uh, and what's my risk appetite and what's the best value for the capital that I'm deploying right. from another angle, right? But I guess, you know, at the end of the day, rubber hits the road and I have to get myself prepared for it. And I'm, I'm, Maybe I will ask you this again, Farhan. And if 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 you were to actually talk to your fellow, you know, professionals out there in the audience, and from your own standpoint, what would you think, you know, could be the typical quote unquote proactive preparatory activities uh, that the bank could look at as it's looking to implement Basel IV? Well, uh, obviously, I mean, the the uh, I think uh, Xavier had a good slide up there, starting with governance. I would say. You know, the, the first step after that is, once you have that sorted out, is an impact analysis and gap analysis. Because uh, uh, unless you know how your current situation, your current, uh, you know, systems, and I'm not talking just about, you know, one aspect of it. This, this affects your data, it affects your process, and it affects your systems. So all three get affected. Um, and, and all three need to be looked at very critically uh, and you have to map your current situation to the new rules and identify the gaps. And, and so that has to be, uh, you know, the, the very first step. And then, you know, the rest of it actually follows uh, quite naturally. It, I'm not saying it's, it, it's done very easily. It's a very challenging uh, thing to achieve, um, which is where I think uh, this is better labeled puzzle four rather than uh, puzzle three final reform. So in thinking, as I said earlier, it is Basel III final reforms, but in implementation, it is actually Basel IV. 
Um, and so that's where the key challenge uh, kicks in. And then that might, may or may not lead to, uh, you know, a, a requirement for additional capital, et cetera, depending on your portfolio profile, depending upon size of your PNL, which will affect your uh, operational risk charge or the complexity of your market operations, which, which affects your, you know, uh, market risk side of, of, of capital. So that comes much later. But I think the if I were to, to, to sum it up, I think the bulk of the effort is right there in the middle, where, where you're identifying your gaps, uh, identifying, uh, you know, how it affects your data systems, uh, data process and systems, and putting in place measures to address those gaps. Data process and systems and putting in measures. That's, um, and, and identifying the gaps to make sure they are addressed. Xavier, I mean, if I was to turn that, would you call them as the critical success factors as well? Or would you have another spin to what I would call as challenges and critical success factors for a successful, effective deployment of Basel 4? I think the critical success factor is to have a global strategy and not to take uh, one reform after another or one topic, risk topic after another. Is to have to establish a global strategy where you that is backed by your CFO and your CRO, and to uh, integrate that into the business, into the man business the top, management. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to have a view from the top before you go further is, is what I hear you say loud and clear. Well, I, I do see a few quest, uh, hands going up. Uh, my re recommendation, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, it would be much easier if you could type your questions. You could see a small icon at the bottom of your screen called Q&A. You could write your questions there. Uh, try not to be anonymous. We could call out your names as well. Uh, and we'll try to answer as much as we can in the next 10 minutes uh, with our eminent panelists here. So before I take the questions from the audience, it's time to ask the audience a question. So here we go with question three. How is Basel IV best executed from your own perspective? Is it executed best with your own internal resources who are actually doing their business as usual activities and a Basel IV rollout? Or you think having a dedicated internal team focusing on Basel IV is good? Would you like it to be implemented with a fully outsourced unit, third party unit, or you think it's a good idea to have a hybrid of both internal and external? Uh, I think it looks like, you know, there's going to be a majority voting in a certain manner. I don't want to be preempting it, but I could see, I could see the trend or the perspective out there. Now, uh, while we are waiting for the audience to poll, uh, you know, my question, Xavier, is you have, you've seen this from various parts of the world, right? Now, do you see the adoption of external assistance, let's say, more prominent in some parts of the world, or you see them pretty much uniform around the world? Uh, I wouldn't say there is significant uh, diversity, uh, divergence across the world. I think one key element is, is, to, um, is to keep the key knowledge also internally. You cannot only, uh, you have to, to have this handover. You have to take this knowledge of Basel IV into your own people. So this can happen in, in various ways. Of course, they, there is a, a boost that you need to give to the project and most of the banks call on external resource to do that, but it's very important that your internal people get up to date with the details uh, of Basel IV so that you keep this knowledge within the bank. Interesting. Let's see what our audience have to say. And lo and behold, they, they completely concur with you, Xavier. They could see that 72% of the audience believe it is a hybrid approach with internal and external support. You can't do it without you know, making sure that there is a transfer of knowledge uh, done with the internal team actually embracing it, imbibing it, and internalizing it, right? Uh, so with that, let's jump to the last section of our session today. And I could see a few questions out there. Uh, there was a question from Dr. Kareem Mohammed that's, in fact, he's asked this question much earlier when you were presenting, Zavir. Could you elaborate more with regard to integrating between ILAP 
and ICAP. Uh, would you like to take that, Xavier? Of course. Uh, so in, in the ILAP and the ICAP, there are requirements for capital planning, liquidity planning, as well as stress testing and making different scenarios of stress testing. And so uh, you should make sure that those requirements, that the solution that you are putting in place uh, for the next 10, 15 years is taking these requirements into account. And for me, this means that the solution by which you, you compute those Basel metrics, that this solution is also able to do, to, to establish scenarios that you can define scenarios in that, and that is, it is able to project your business to the future, as well as computing those different metrics on your projected business. This is important for planning. This is important for stress testing. And if you can do that, you really help uh, managing the business, the risk, and you also uh, responding to the requirement of ILAP, ICAP in those two areas. Thank you. I hope that answers uh, Dr. Karim's question. There's another one from uh, Sara Abdul Karim. Um, and maybe uh, Farhan, I would pose this to you. Uh, which area within risk management would you expect to be most impacted by the new Basel rules in the GCC and particularly in Kuwait? Okay. I think, uh, look, it touches all areas of uh, all the pillar one areas of risk, uh, surely. But if I were to pick one, I, I should say credit risk. Uh, because credit risk uh, normally it is is the highest uh, user of, of capital, number one, uh, attracts the most capital. And number two, if you look at the rules, I think that's where the most amount of granularity and, and sensitivity has been introduced uh, at this point in time. And uh, also, uh, you know, in terms of effort required, if I were to just break the effort. Now, this is a bit, I'm a little bit in speculation territory because obviously we don't have, uh, we haven't gone through the process, uh, but just looking at, at what we have, uh, I, I would say that there will be a fair amount of work required uh, to have those kinds of portfolio cuts and those kinds of details available in order to successfully implement, uh, you know, the credit risk side of it. Interesting. So credit is where you see the, yeah maximum focus to be. And also, I think the other point I should make, because it's uh, specific to GCC and, and Kuwait, you know, the other side, the, 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 for, for large majority of the banks, uh, the other risks are not as significant. So market risk operations, the product suites, et cetera, are, are banks in the region uh, tend to be more uh, straightforward and, uh, and will not probably require as much of a you know, relatively simpler, I guess. Yeah. And, and the implementation will probably be, depending on national discretion, would probably be the simplified approach for market risk, for example. Right. So again, credit risk, I think, is probably the answer here. That's right. Uh, there's a question from uh, Fahim. Um, and this may be, Zewe, you may want to take it. Uh, and I know you presented this, but I guess nothing better than articulating it again here. If there is a checklist for implementing Basel IV, what is it? I think it's do your governance, uh, set up your governance with CFO and CRO, uh, assess your cur current situation and make your gap analysis from a system point of view, make your business impact analysis for, the, for all the proportionality and so on, um, and then uh, plan in phases, in phases but within a global strategy. Thank you. I think I think they tested your memories of it and you actually just... <laughs> 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 well, I could see some hands raised. Uh, I see uh, Pascal Maksud, you put your hand up. If you don't mind, if you can type your question, it would be much easier for us, uh, please. Uh, while we are waiting for those questions, there are a couple of others. Uh, what is the key change in terms of large exposure? This is a question from Raghavendra. Do you want to take that, Xavier? The key change in terms of large ex large exposure, uh, we are um, we are moving from um, the the reference 
uh, and let me check my notes because I have uh, my notes on that. Um, so the, the reference is not anymore is uh, not anymore uh, the eligible capital. So normally a large exposure, the definition is if it's above above 10% of, eli of eligible capital, that's what it is today. And now it is not anymore on eligible capital, but it's 10% of tier one capital. Okay. So it is, uh, it is 10% uh, of a smaller amount. Instead of the total capital, it's only the tier one capital. And that changes your threshold. And mm. so this will have an impact. Significant impact, I'm assuming, yeah. So yeah. I guess Raghavendra, your question was answered there. Uh, there is another question here, uh, uh, which is actually, you know, this, this anonymous. So it is an interesting question, all the same. And for you, Farad, how will the implementation of GCC be different from other parts of the world? I mean, you have a view on that? Um, look, I think, uh, yes, I, I think I have some idea. Um, uh, so national discretion, number one, will play a very important role. That's almost guaranteed, uh, because as we have seen from previous implementations, uh, Basel III, as well as the more recent IFRS 9 implementation that we have done, so one thing is almost certain that, uh, that there will be a fair amount of, nat uh, of national discretion. The other thing I, I should say is that within the countries, uh, between the countries within GCC, I think there will be a fair amount of a large degree of consistency and, and homogeneity. I think uh, uh, generally the regulators within the region talk to each other and they don't stray too far from, from, from one another. Uh, that's number two. Number three, I think you will see uh, more simplified approaches applied for, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, for what is perceived to be, you know, uh, simpler operations uh, like market risk on the market risk side, the simplified approach. In fact, Qatar has already opted for the simplified approach, right? Um, so the path of least resistance is to the extent possible. Uh, again, on the credit risk side, for example, in your way, you have an option of, uh, you know, going either with, with, uh, with the external ratings or the SCRA uh, uh, methodology. You know, my sense is that most regulators would probably mm -hmm. opt for the external ratings. Uh, mm -hmm. And that has already started with Qatar again has already done that. Um, so, uh, so, so on the credit risk side, on the other aspects of it, I, I don't think there will be a, a huge difference. Um, uh, I think they will largely implement, uh, you know, the, the, the requirements. On the market risk side, they will opt for the simplified uh, version. On the ops risk side, I suspect, again, this is a little bit in the speculation territory, I think uh, the ILM would probably be set at a one. You know the uh, the the factor in the in the operational risk uh, 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 capital, uh, which takes into account your historical uh, losses. You know, fifteen times your ten-year historical losses, and there's a factor you're supposed to come up with. Uh, I think that aspect of it, national discussion will ignore, and it will probably be probably be set at one. So these are just some of the things that come to mind immediately. Um, uh, but if you compare GCC as a group with let's say more developed markets like let's say uh, Europe, et cetera, I think uh, you will see some simpler versions of certain aspects of the uh, Basel final reform. And I think it's not just, while it may be oriented as a GCC, you see them still to be a very national level yeah. conversation and- Yes, it is, I, I, certainly. I, I would say that, that uh, there's a, a huge amount of, of uh, central bank involvement in all such uh, initiatives. Um, uh, they will they will comply, but I think they will uh, be very involved. Excellent. Uh, I guess we've run out of time, and I I could see there are three four questions, but I'll probably pick only one. Uh, keeping in mind we've run out of time, uh, this is a question uh, from Siddhartha Kunduru. Uh, maybe Zave, you may want to answer this. Are all the banks, regardless of its size, required to implement the norms framed as part of Basel IV? If not, is there any exception to it? So, sorry, can you repeat? Is there an exception to Basel IV depending on the size or profile of a bank? Uh, 
I would say that the exceptions are taken into account are within the Basel framework. And so Basel, all banks should come into, into Basel IV. And within Basel IV, there are, which is the proportionality, there are aspects that are very uh, low demanding, uh, that have a very low threshold. So, many, so paradoxical, right? You you want an exemption, you got to first be compliant, and then you can make an exception. There. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You need to be in the exception within the framework. But, the framework. Uh, but yeah. that depends. That depends uh, on the local implementation yeah. because. Yeah. Basel is for the internationally active banks, Pardon. and it is the local regulator that will determine what is for non-internationally active banks. And so those smaller banks will depend on the derogation of the local supervisor. Makes sense, makes sense. Look, I mean, the number of questions out here that still keep flowing in just shows how hot this topic is and how interested and engaged our audience are. But unfortunately, as they say, all good things need to come to an end. And I have to draw the curtains here, but for those of you who still want to ask those questions, you could direct them uh, to the uh, IBS intelligence team and they would we would do our best to actually get those questions posed to our panelists, compile those answers and come back to you. Uh, with that, if I may you know, take this opportunity once again to thank you for our wonderful, great insights. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you very much. Pleasure having you here. And Xavier, what, what insights and and, and a lot of checklists, as they called it, right? And, and I guess a lot of our people in the audience will make the most of it, yeah. Thank you once again. Have a great evening, everyone.